So what I want to do today um, is really, you know, try to be um, as succinct as possible and, and try to focus um, my comments on, you know, sort of the, the questions I think about the Vietnam War and, and what it, what it, you know, the challenges that um, I think about when I'm trying to teach it to my students. Um, and that really, you know, I, I call it the, the who, what, when, where, why of the Vietnam War. There are all these questions um, that remain about, about that conflict. Um, and, you know, the, the first one, I think, is just, just simply, what do we call that war? I think it's very, you know, it's important to me whenever I start um, a course uh, in, in discussing it about my students, because what you call it, what you name it, um, is very important because it's going to, you know, emphasize different aspects uh, of the history as, as you move forward in, in teaching about this conflict. Um, the second question that I identified, um, you know, and after we figure out what do we even call that war is, you know, who was in charge? Who led the fight um, and why? Why did they bring um, their countries uh, to, to, this, to this conflict, to this war? Um, and so that was, you know, another big one that of course, you know, really want my students to understand because they're, you know, the, the reasons, the rationale, the drivers for their farm policies um, and their war efforts, it's gonna vary. They're gonna vary across the spectrum depending on which uh, combat and which party you're looking at. The third question is, you know, this is this is you know kind of the the, the bread and butter of, of what historians like to do. It's, it's all about periodization. So when did the war begin? When did it end? What are the turning points? How would you you know sort of discuss um, the the history and, and how it unfolded, uh, the history of that conflict and how it unfolded? Um, why would you sort of break it up in in the discrete sections that you do? What are the continuities? What are the discontinuities? Et cetera, et cetera. And the other question that I have, uh, of course, is, is how did the war end? Um, and, and when I say this, not just, you know, when uh, did the fighting, um, when did the fight exist, but also when do we think about its ending in terms of its legacies? Um, and so, you know, those are the sort of questions, um, the who, what, when, why, where uh, of the Vietnam War uh, that I want to address tonight. Again, it, I, I don't feel like I cannot do this sort of 30 minute overview of, of, of just the, the history of the war, the narrative of the, of the war. Um, and so I really want to kind of focus on these questions. But before I do, um, and before I move forward, uh, you know, with the main part of my lecture, I do want to say three things. The first is that that, you know, given what Jeremy had just sort of spelled out about my, about my, um, you know, sort of my research and what I've been doing since I was a graduate student, um, it really focuses on the Vietnamese perspectives. And that's what I'm going to emphasize in my lecture, because I think, you know, that's, that's the one that's harder to access. Um, and, you know, it's, it's more difficult to come by in terms of, of, you know, history books that look at the North and South Vietnamese perspectives. And that's, you know, clearly a reflection about, about the sort of availability of primary sources, which I hope we can talk about um, in the Q&A. The second thing I want to emphasize is that, um, you know, I'll also look closely at the regional international context in which the war unfolded. And, you know, for the same reasons that I want to focus on the Vietnamese perspectives, the, the regional and international context um, tends to be forgotten or downplayed uh, in the vast majority of, of studies um, on the war. So I just, I want to emphasize that a bit more. Um, and then the third is that uh, what I want to, what I want to do is really focus on the early part of the war, in, in particular, the decisions that led um, the Vietnamese parties in the United States um, to the conflict uh, by the 60s and by the 70s. Uh, and the reason I want to do that is that it sort of, it also coincides with the primary sources that I, uh, that I shared with you uh, for tonight. All right, so let's go to, so what's in a name? Lots in a name, I think. Um, you know, in, in teaching about the Vietnam War, I mean, the, I really feel like this is the first issue um, that you'll face, um, you know, basically what to call it. Um, and the answer, of course, depends on your perspective. Um, and where we get that perspective, of course, comes from the immense historiography on that war. I think one scholar um, put the number of studies to, at 40,000 titles, and this he made about a decade ago. So I don't even want to 
I don't even want to contemplate what what the number is now, but it's so high that it really you know rivals that of the uh, of the histories of the American Civil War, uh, First World War. I don't think it's anywhere close to the Second World War. Uh, but in short, there's a lot of books out there uh, on the Vietnam War, and you know the vast majority um, of these studies of these of these titles uh, really focus on U.S. intervention and the American experiences, and and most of those studies then are going to refer to that conflict as simply the Vietnam War. Um, the other name you might come across if you're looking through uh, you know, the stacks of books is that the war has been called the Second Indochina War, and it's because it's sandwiched between uh, you know, basically two other wars that are intimately connected um, to, uh, to the Vietnam War, the Second Indochina War. Uh, it's related, of course, to the first, uh, which is known as the French Indochina War, the First Indochina War, um, and the Third Indochina War, which took place um, basically between Vietnam and Cambodia as well as Vietnam uh, against China uh, by the late 1970s. So these histories really take on a much more of a regional uh, perspective. The third name that I've seen ascribed to it um, is, you know, the, the, the Vietnamese War. And here, um, the studies that call it the Vietnamese War really look at the Vietnamese perspectives um, in studying this conflict as a, as a civil war, uh, particularly by area study scholars who are really interested in the post-colonial history or the post-colonial development uh, of Vietnam uh, in the post-45 era. Um, and so I think the Vietnamese War really captures uh, for them uh, really what was at stake what was most important, emphasizing um, this, this very violent period in modern Vietnamese history. And finally, the, the other um, name that you uh, might see ascribed to it is, uh, really comes from Vietnamese language histories translated into English uh, from publishing houses uh, in Hanoi, in Ho Chi Minh City today. And they refer to that war as, as leaders in Hanoi uh, or on the communist side in the South, refer to it uh, as it was taking place. And that's the anti-American struggle for reunification and national uh, salvation. So while all of these names uh, labels, whatever you want to call them, have different emphases and include different historical perspectives. Um, you know, what we're going to see as we move forward is the main cast of characters are going to remain roughly the same. Um, so, you know, we'll, we're going to move forward with that. But I just want to flag uh, sort of when you first approach teaching this, uh, this history of the, of the war, think, you know, about what you want to call it and even even change the names um, as you as you teach your students, um, because I really think that that's, that's going to matter in depending on what you want to what you want to emphasize at any any given time. All right, so moving on to the who question. All right, the combatants. Um, again, this is this is still we're in easy territory before things before I get lost in in the in the trees amid the forest. This always happens to me as someone who's who's spending way too much time uh, researching this war. Uh, there were four combatants or belligerents, uh, belligerent sides to the war. On one side was the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, uh, led by the Vietnam Workers Party. This is the precursor to the Vietnamese Communist Party uh, that comes to the fore in 1976 after the war. But at that time, basically the DRV or Democratic Republic of Vietnam was also known as North Vietnam. Their allies in the South included the National Liberation Front uh, of South Vietnam, or simply the NLF. Uh, they've been referred to as the Viet Cong or the Viet Cong. This is a derogatory term, or it's a controversial term. Uh, and so when I teach it uh, in my courses to my students, I use the NLF if I'm talking about the political organization that ran, um, that, that led the Southern insurgency, uh, or I call their military forces um, the People's Liberation Army forces, the PLAF. And if any of you are interested, I can, I can give you the acronyms. They are legend in the Vietnam War. I mean, you have so many. It's like, a, it's like, it's like alphabet soup. Uh, so the NLF, uh, or uh, we refer to the Southern Revolutionary Movement, um, its, its, its leading uh, organization as either the NLF or the Provisional Revolutionary Government of South Vietnam, or the PRG after 1969, when the PRG takes the NLF's place. 
On the other side, uh, you have the Republic of Vietnam uh, that is uh, led by the government based in Saigon. Uh, there are two republics during this period of, of, of the, the war. Uh, the first republic uh, was founded by Ngo Dinh Diem, and we'll talk a little bit about him. And the second republic was founded really um, while the war already began uh, in 1966-67. The second republic fell under uh, President Nguyen Van Thieu and Nguyen Gao Ki. Uh, that flag um, is also, you know, still visible today, even though the RVN uh, is a, a, a vanquished regime, because you still see it used in US politics today, most recently, uh, during the uh, the storming of the Capitol. Um, a lot of a lot of those who took part, um, Vietnamese Americans, uh, flew that flag. And so to me, it was a uh, it was it was hard to see that alongside the Confederate flag on the steps of the Capitol. And of course, the party that we all know involved in the Vietnam War, uh, the United States. Um, and so the DRV and LF on one side, uh, the US RVN on the other. Now, okay, now the picture gets a little bit murkier uh, as, as we discuss you know, their, their uh, individual uh, objectives in the war, uh, why their leaders began the fight when they did, um, and even who led the charge in these respective parties. All of this is really still contested because particularly for uh, the Vietnamese sides, the primary sources just aren't there uh, for us to say definitively, okay, X was in charge um, or Y was in charge at any given time. Likewise, even with um, the histories that focus on American decision making at any you know uh you you, uh, you could pick up a book uh, any book or, or, or books and you'll see you know the debate between you know was it the presidents was it their uh was it you know their advisors who really crafted policy uh with regard to vietnam so again uh because there is no such thing as objectivity in history these are all interpretations and as a result um you know, what I'm going to present to you now, again, is just a sort of uh, what I see as, as various interpretations of these parties and their objectives uh, during the war. Okay. First, of course, we'll focus uh, on the United States. All right. Um, I love this, this picture. I think this was uh, the president's attending um, Jeremy, I wish I could call on you, we could tag team, but that might be Hoover's um, funeral. Uh, in any case, it was very hard to get them all in one screen, but but there they are. Um, I think it is was, Hoover's funeral. I think it you're is right. Hoover's funeral, right? Yeah, I think in one of my, I have very silly lectures, which I'm very happy to share with you all, um, where I, I I put little, because of course my my images never say the things I want or include the people I want. I think I put Nixon in the, in, in the middle, in between uh, LBJ and, and Eisenhower, because if I want to sort of represent the whole, you know, um, panel of, of presidents who, who waged war in Vietnam and maybe even sneak forward in there. I've done that. So if you ever need doctored images, uh, I have them. I have them in spades. <laughs> All right. Um, so one interpretation um, that has been put forward uh, in terms of, of what the United States sought in Vietnam in terms of uh, preserving this non-communist government in South Vietnam, uh, why it was so committed to that, um, was that, you know, basically the U.S. policymakers pursued uh, this notion of flawed containment, that leaders in Washington applied the grand strategy of containment um, in the Cold War era to Vietnam when uh, they shouldn't have. Um, basically, in this effort to contain China, in other words, uh, China following the orders of, of the Soviet Union, uh, a stand had to be made in Vietnam, as, as this argument goes. And so this preservation of a non-communist government in Saigon was extremely important. Um, otherwise, you know, if we, if we lose Saigon, if we lose South Vietnam to communism, who knows what it'll set off in terms of a chain reaction, in terms of, of, a, of a row of dominoes leading all the way to, heck, who knows, maybe even California, uh, dominoes falling in the region. So this was one interpretation put forward in terms of this you know, pursuit of a flawed containment strategy uh, in, in Vietnam. The other interpretation put forward um, is that it wasn't so much about containment. Uh, we just have to look at the Pentagon Papers, uh, you know, when, when they were uh, slowly being published in 1971, um, and definitely afterwards. Now that we can look through through the various volumes, but if you there's one in particular of a document that showed, you know, sort of if it was. Um, 
20% containment, it was 70% credibility. Um, so this notion of credibility, whether it be the nation's, uh, you know, sort of reputation online or individual presidents' uh, credibility on the line, that those were the reasons that, that led uh, US leaders um, down the path of war. So particularly after Truman, uh, as we know, lost China, I love using this to my students because it's like, how do you lose a whole country? Did you put it in your pocket? But yes, so Truman being blamed for losing China uh, after Mao Zedong announced the creation of the People's Republic of China in October of 1949. After that, no president, especially democratic ones, ever wanted to be accused of being soft on communism and losing Vietnam um, in the way that Truman lost China. So while historians may argue containment, credibility, um, you know, they, they, they argue about how to characterize this decision-making process that was either guided by containment and credibility. Um, you know, they may subscribe to this idea of a quagmire that every president passed the buck, uh, making short-sighted decisions that eventually led the United States to Vietnam. On the other side, you have those who subscribe to the stalemate thesis that basically, no, 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 it wasn't quagmire. It was like every administration did the right thing. They carried out sound policy policies, but nevertheless, the United States failed um, and, and faced a stalemate in Vietnam thanks to events outside uh, of, of policymaking. But one thing that you know, I think that all scholars can agree upon those who focus on US policy towards Vietnam um, is this idea of connectivity, right? That, you know, the one crisis in Asia had a major impact on another uh, in the sense of, of how the United States tied together the region. Um, and so here, you know, US occupation of Japan was transformed with the founding of the People's Republic of China, right? And that heavily influenced the Korean War. Well, now we're no longer gonna punish our Japanese enemy, but we're going to rehabilitate them. Uh, that that's you know one of the one of, that's one of the um, byproducts of the Korean War. Well, the lessons from Korea are going to follow to Vietnam as well as to Laos. Uh, you know you're going to see the miracle on the Han, the rebuilding of the uh, the South Korean economy thanks to the Vietnam War. Again, you have these connections in terms of U.S. Um, handling of crises all in Asia, except for the one that I wished had a more direct uh, connection, and that would be U.S. policy towards Indonesia uh, and Vietnam in late 19. 65 and you guys can that that's my I'm going to dangle that out there if anyone wants to ask me you know why I didn't wish or why I wish for a stronger connection or or, or what happened in showing that there was uh, no connection between between US uh, policy towards Indonesia um, in in late 1965 and policy towards Vietnam in late 1965 all right so okay so that was the united states i love you know it's 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 something that you can really present easily to your students you know you can even say the three c's containment credibility connectivity it all falls apart when you get to the vietnamese sides and i'm, I'm noticing time so i kind of really want to i want to i want to get through this quickly okay so so in terms of of the vietnamese parties um what it, things get a little bit, you know, the Vietnamese counterpart uh, and their and their objectives in terms of the war. It's a little bit more complicated. And what I want to do now um, is just emphasize that you know it is without a doubt that the U.S. became involved for Vietnam for its own reasons, uh, be they consumed with Cold War imperatives, sought to shore up an ally like France and Europe, feared a red China-dominated Asia, or reasons that are more wrapped uh, in domestic politics and personal credibility. One of the things that is all also extremely clear to me is that Vietnamese actors uh, also wielded much influence and agency over the trans over the events that transpired uh, in the latter half of the 20th century um, in Vietnam. So one of the things that um, I do when I when I teach this course, um, and again, I'm happy to share my lectures that that talk about any discrete uh, episode or period in Vietnamese history with with all of you. So just just you know. Murph or, or Jeremy, like share my share my email um, address with 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 all the teachers here. But I know it's so. What I like to do um, in in looking at the roots of of the Vietnamese War is to emphasize three things to the students. The first um, is that state building and nation building in both North and South Vietnam uh, in the aftermath of the Geneva Conference that divided the country at the 17th parallel that ended the French Indochina War, um, that these projects in state building and nation building took place amid growing uh, tensions, uh, took place amid war, basically. 
Um, so that the, you know, it's, it's very important to understand that about the, the post-colonial trajectories uh, of North and South Vietnam. The other thing that always, I don't know, amazes my students is that I, I try to focus um, not just on the differences uh, between North and South uh, Vietnam, but I think it's more interesting to actually emphasize the similarities. Uh, both countries, uh, you know, North and South of the 17th parallel, they underwent similar travails in nation building. Um, you know, this would include land reform, this would include, you know, sort of visions that the leaders had for their countries, um, despite, you know, the RVN and the DRV being at opposite sides of the ideological divide. Uh, the third thing I want to emphasize, or I always emphasize to the students, um, is that in the failures, uh, you know, to, to launch certain programs in nation building and state building in both North and South Vietnam, that these failures would lead directly to the rise of the National Liberation Front or the importance of the Southern insurgency, not only within the entire country, uh, but the region as well as internationally. This would really lead, uh, in other words, to the Vietnam War. So what I see in, in, in that sort of, you know, emphasizing the similarities um, is that both of, of uh, North and South Vietnamese leaders on the period leading up to the, the onset of the Vietnamese Civil War focused on consolidating power uh, in their own hands. So on the RVN side, the Republic of Vietnam side and South Vietnam, under the Ngo brothers, uh, they, you know, basically consolidated power to, into the authoritarian executive branch, and in particular to the family's hands. I mean, it's all about the Ngo brothers. Uh, I, I call this part the House of Ngo, um, in which I introduce uh, Ngo Dinh Nhu, uh, who's on the left, and of course, President Ngo Dinh Diem on, on the right. But I also introduce, you know, Madame Nhu, uh, as well as Archbishop Pope, um, who is who's their elder brother. On the, the North Vietnamese side or the DRV side, uh, I emphasize the, the role of the comrades Lei, in particular Lei Yung, pictured on the left, uh, and his right-hand deputy, uh, Lei Duc Tha. Uh, what they did, just like uh, the Ngo brothers in the South, was that they consolidated power in the North in party apparatchik hands. Both sides repressed their own societies, um, and again, here I'm thinking about land reform, I'm thinking about dissident campaigns that were stamped out. And finally, they also uh, sought to really marginalize or eliminate, depending on which side you were, the communist insurgency. Uh, while the South under the Ngo brothers basically sought to eliminate them, to kill them, to assassinate them, in the North, what party leaders in Hanoi and Party Central tried to do was basically take over the communist insurgency. So usurp them from Southern, southern hands. And that's why I argue that, you know, it's very important that this really leads to this contestation uh, over either controlling or annihilating um, the, the, the National Liberation Front uh, and, the, and the armed wing, the, the People's Liberation Armed Forces. Um, so again, so that's, I think, very important uh, to remember about, you know, sort of, uh, it really was, you know, sort of this nation building, state building amid war that led both North and South Vietnam back to war. Because as they increased the repression uh, in their societies, as they sought to control the communist insurgency or wipe them out entirely, this really led to full scale war between these two countries that then paved the way for foreign intervention. Uh, leading to, of course, my second point that it's not everything that happened on the ground within Vietnam that decided that brought about the Vietnam War. The international context matters a lot. Uh, and again, we can get into this more in Q&A, but on the comrades lay side, it was all about the Sino-Soviet split. So in many ways, you know, while the East-West rivalry was, is very important to understand the Vietnam War as a whole, to understand Hanoi's, uh, you know, sort of path in terms of its revolution, one really needs to understand the ins and outs of the Sino-Soviet uh, split. And you know, uh, the, the Vietnam Workers Party, the Vietnamese communist leadership, they weren't alone in this. Uh, one, of the, one of the things you see again and again of course, is, is looking at how communist parties had to, to, to navigate, uh, you know, feuding Moscow and Beijing, you know, who, who tried to force communist parties to choose one side or the other. Because the Vietnamese uh, liberation struggle was the one that attracted global attention, the stakes were higher for the Chinese and the Soviets uh, in the Vietnamese war. For the Soviets, it was all about, you know, sort of showing that Soviet weaponry could defeat American weaponry on Vietnamese 
these battlefields uh, for, you know, the Chinese, it was all about, you know, the, the Vietnamese will show how Mao's protracted, um, you know, people's warfare uh, could win on Vietnamese soil. It wasn't just something specific to, to Chinese soil. So they both had a vested interest in, she, in seeing uh, their uh, sort of their, their uh, campaigns in the Vietnamese war. Uh, and it was, of course, great for them because it would be Vietnamese lives that would be spent and not Soviet and Chinese ones. Likewise, to understand how the Brothers Ngo, you know, sort of um, uh, escalated their, their uh, anti-communist campaigns, uh, how that would bring in uh, basically the Kennedy administration uh, following uh, the Taylor uh, Rostow uh, report in 1961, Operation Beef Up in 1962, how the United States became more involved when it was clear that, you know, basically the, the Mill brothers were bringing about the fall uh, of, the, of the Saigon government in their quest to stamp out all um, dissent, be they of a communist stripe or say a political Buddhist stripe, that this, this brought more US involvement as they were, you know, basically seeing that there was no way that we can have this stable ally in Saigon. They look like they're bent on this, you know, road to destruction. We have to intervene um, directly. And of course, this wouldn't fall on, on Kennedy um, because of course, he would be assassinated. It would fall on his successor, pictured here, Lyndon Baines Johnson. All right, I really got to get through this again, getting caught in this. But because you have this in the primary source, um, one of the things that I, I, again, you know, in emphasizing these mirror developments taking place in uh, Saigon and Hanoi, same thing for, you know, mirror uh, image uh, developments taking place in Hanoi as they're taking in Washington, D.C. And the one that I like to talk to my students about is, you know, we all know how LBJ uh, received carte blanche, uh, you know, a, a blind check to wage war in Vietnam. But Le Zuan did it six months earlier. He did it in not, at the end of 1963 with Resolution 9. Uh, and in this resolution, you know, whereas before the Northern uh, Communist Party leaders were still focused on bringing about a socialist revolution uh, in the DRV, Le Zuan was able to get them to just abandon that and focus full scale on the Southern war effort. He was also in doing that, um, basically saying, okay, you know, the the South Vietnamese Communist Party, they're not winning the war in the time frame that we need them to win it by. Uh, we're going to have to send Viet North Vietnamese boys several hundred miles away to fight. And this quote is going to be important because you're going to see, of course, that LBJ makes the same one for the Americans. He's sending them south. Uh, it starts before the 63 resolution, but it really picks up uh, after 1963. He's also going to put forward his military strategy to victory, and this is going to be called the General Offensive and General Uprising. It seeks total victory over the Saigon regime. He's, he wants total war, uh, big unit war under this, under this strategy. Uh, the third important thing that he's going to do with Resolution 9 uh, is abandon Hanoi's policy of equilibrium in the Sino-Soviet split and clearly tilt North Vietnam towards China. He's also going to appoint his main general. This is Kosvin, Central Office of South Vietnam, Kosvin Commander Nguyen Chi Tan. Now, again, these are the folks that people don't know, but it matches up so perfectly uh, with the American side. Uh, six months later, LBJ is going to get the same exact thing that Le Zuan gets uh, with Resolution 9 of 1963. And here, even though he campaigns, this happens in the summer of 1964. So JFK is assassinated in late November of 1963. LBJ is just focused on being elected uh, in the fall of that year. He does not want to seem like the warmonger. He paints Barry Goldwater as that. So he wants to look more like the peace candidate. If you elect Barry Goldwater, he's going to start a nuclear war that's going to you know, annihilate a girl picking a daisy. That's a very, uh, you know, popular commercial that 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 made headway uh, during the election year. In any case, he promises uh, in his campaign that he would not send American boys nine to ten thousand miles away to do what Asian boys ought to be doing in themselves. Again, a promise. Uh, he was focused much more on domestic programs uh, than intervention in Vietnam. So he's the opposite of Le Zuan in that way. But he, you know, and again, in his colorful language, as you all know better than I do, because you're there in in, in Texas, uh, in Austin in particular, that he calls, of course, you know, the, 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 the love of his life or the lady um, as a great society uh, program and that, you know, that bitch of a war uh, in Vietnam, so in very gendered terms. 
Uh, in the 1960 Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, you also uh, see, you know, this move that really sets off American military intervention in Vietnam. It's the decision about bombing, uh, which you which you see in that fork in the road memo that I that I shared with you. All of this is taking place in the aftermath of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, in which Congress, in a joint resolution, gives LBJ again, as I said, carte blanche. He does not have to declare war um, in Vietnam. And finally, just as Hanoi now can tilt towards China, uh, why LBJ uses or always chooses this gradualist um, uh, path to war in Vietnam, never going to do what the JCS, the Joint Chiefs of Staff want, which is basically bomb them fast, bomb them hard, send in the troops. He's like, no, that's not a good idea. Again, I don't want to be the warmonger. I also don't want to negotiate and withdraw. Um, and, and you know, the, the reason to take this gradual path to escalation is fear of Chinese intervention. Again. Korea playing on the minds of American decision makers uh, as it as it applies to Vietnam. And finally, just like Lei Zuan, he appoints MACV commander William Westmoreland, um, who really, you know, you see the changes between MAG military assistance advisory group uh, to when it becomes MACV uh, under Westmoreland. And he, he goes to Honolulu, Tan goes south um, to the front. All right. Um, I think what I'm going to do here is, you know, I'm already about 40 minutes. Uh, what I turn to at this point is really to talk about periodization and the highlights. And I'm not going to go through this. Uh, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm happy to answer questions, but really just go quickly through it. Um, and again, just flag something you don't understand, and I'll, and I'll explain to you why I put certain events um, in in certain uh, distinct periods. All right. So 54-59, as I said, it's really about state and nation building. I would emphasize Eisenhower's decision to replace France at Geneva um, as a very important highlight. Again, Le Zouan's Resolution 15, his first um, uh, decision to put Hanoi on the road to war, uh, ZM's anti-communist campaign. Uh, the next stage I would talk about is sort of this low-level civil conflict that unfolds as both sides uh, are picking up, um, you know, arms once again, and that really takes place between 1960 and 1963. What's important to highlight here is JFK's decision to really beef up American presence. Um, the next one, of course, is the November assassinations of Ngo Dinh Diem and his brother Ngo Dinh Nhu, followed three weeks later by the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Um, Lei Zuan's Resolution 9, 1963, which is really taken because of these assassinations. Um, finally, that leads to the, the third stage, which is the internationalization of the war. And here we discussed Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, leading to Operation Rolling Thunder. And of course, as you're going to have a sustained bombing campaign, you're going to need ground troops to protect the air bases. And you're not going to have them make just, you know, follow uh, this enclave strategy. You're going to let them march further afield, further away from the air bases to, to perform search and destroy operations. This is really, again, that slippery slope or that gradual escalation uh, that we saw under JFK. The other thing I would emphasize is the founding of the Second Republic of Vietnam uh, in this period. And of course, what I'm working on. Tet Offensive ad nauseum, I can again explain that, but that is really, I think, a turning point uh, in the war. Uh, it's really, you know, the post-Tet strategies for all sides look extremely different uh, than the, the, the pre-Tet strategies. Uh, you also have, of course, uh, Nixon and Kissinger uh, come into uh, the White House. Their strategies are going to depart uh, from, from LBJs. Les Zwans is going to have to change due to uh, the casualties that the, the communist war effort incurred. And then, of course, the Second Republic under Wing Bang Pew. Um, also of importance, again, the Sino-Soviet border clashes. This really changes the equation. If I told you before the Sino-Soviet split mattered a lot to Hanoi's revolution, well, imagine now with the border clashes, now you have not just the Soviet Union and China fighting to control or influence uh, the North Vietnamese war effort. You're now going to have them competing uh, for America's uh, favor. Uh, the other, again, an important thing, this is a regional war, the, the official expansion of the air and ground wars into Cambodia and Laos uh, and the disruption that it caused in the neighboring Indo-Chinese countries. Uh, to 1971-1972, the lead up to Nixon's historic visits uh, to Beijing and to Moscow uh, happening right um, on either side of the Easter offensive undertaken by the communist, uh, by the Vietnamese communists to really, you know, prevent the great powers from selling them out. 
Uh, and finally, the other thing that you know we should also emphasize is that the war isn't just unfolding on the ground in South Vietnam, Cambodia, or Laos, or even as the air war resumes over North Vietnam, but another battlefield opens up, and that is at the Paris negotiations. It's very important to tie in uh, basically the events on the ground with what is transpiring in this new battlefield, uh, the, the international one at the negotiating table that leads basically to a sham peace by 1973. There's no way that, you know, as the, all the sides can't really uh, carve out that much, um, you know, advantage on the battlefield uh, or the negotiating table that they're really going to negotiate in good faith, that they basically, by the end of it, by 1973, uh, it's about just sort of uh, for the Americans a saving face uh, to leave Vietnam and for the North and South Vietnamese about waiting, uh, not even before the ink dries, uh, but to resume war once again. And so there are two ends to uh, the Vietnam War. The first one, of course, the 1973 Paris Agreement uh, that allows the Americans to withdraw. They have a residual force but the real ending of course occurs two years later when the war reverts back to a local or regional war. The first fall of a domino is the fall of Phnom Penh in Cambodia. The one that we all know much more, I definitely do, because that's when I left Vietnam with the fall of Saigon uh, on April 30th, 1975, and months later with the fall of Vientiane uh, in Laos. So only two other dominoes fell along with South Vietnam. Uh, when you look at the legacies, if you look at how, again, there's still so much that we're dealing with uh, in terms of, of the Vietnam War, uh, the casualties alone will just blow your mind. Again, these are the statistics when you look at, at, at the Indochinese who died um, during the Second Indochina War. If you looked at the, the, the total of, of bombs dropped uh, over Cambodia, North Vietnam, Laos, and South Vietnam, they far surpassed the Korean War and they far surpassed the Second World War. And then, of course, that really startling statistic, just compare that to American deaths. Um, but at the same time, this is what this is what we know uh, in much greater detail. I still remember when um, deaths from the the uh, pandemic overtook the Vietnam War, um, and the citation, of course, was was the amount of American deaths at sixty five thousand. So I'm going to end it there. I went way over time. I'm sorry, Jeremy, uh, but I hope that it helps when when you guys ask me questions and when you break away uh, to look at these primary source documents that I shared with you. Try to focus on you know where you see credibility, where you see containment, where you see Les Wan's, uh commitment to liberating the South through armed conflict, and not focusing on uh, northern transformation uh, of the economy. All of that's there in those primary sources. And the last thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up, uh, is that primary sources matter. There is so much rich historical uh, primary source documentation uh, that's available online. And there are now translated materials on the Vietnamese sides. And so if you're ever interested in showing, you know, like what I love to do, which is these sort of mirror image developments taking place, you can do that now uh, with the extent of primary sources made available on the Vietnamese side.